Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's going to get any easier. Nope. <laughs> Hi, guys. Everybody there? I am. Oh, good. You can hear me. I am. Hello? Yes, you sure too. Good. I'm glad to see this is working. Now, if I can figure out how to share my desktop, let's try that. Oh, that's fancy, fancy. So, everybody can see it? Yep. So, who do I have here? Meeting has started. You guys see my desktop, right? Yeah. yeah. So, if I switch back to Beacon Learning, you can see that. As I move my mouse around, is it tracking for you? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Chris. No, I'm good. Okay. All righty. So I'm not sure. It doesn't show me on here for participants. There. Let's see who else is here. I think you had it on the last page. Say that again? I think you had it on the other page. I think it showed who was on. Oh, when I was here? Yeah, I think. Oh, well, that shows who's invited. Oh, I see. But this right here shows who all is here. So. Okay, and well, that's fine. Um, if you guys, everybody have the chat window down here so you can type a question and interrupt me if you need to? Yes. Yeah. All righty. So let's get started. I'll try to make this as quick and painless as I can. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm going to try to go through it all, too, just to make sure that you guys have what you need to get started. So let's start with where we are today. There was homework two and three should have been turned in by 6 o'clock. I know some of you got it in a little after that, and that's fine. Uh, a few people didn't get it turned in. I don't know. I don't remember who all. Um, quiz and project one. So that was what was due by start of the class today. And then we're going to go over chapters four and five quickly tonight. So I'm going to start through the PowerPoint, but most of the time I'm just going to refer back to the uh, Excel demonstration exercises that you all should have on your thumb drives. Steve, you meant uh, chapter you meant chapter two was due by today, chapter right? Chapter two, Not ch homework, and or, chapter or, three, homework, right here. I mean, uh, I mean, you said quiz one. You meant quiz two, right? Oh, did I say yeah? Quiz two and homework two and three, right there, Got were it. due by the beginning of class. Did I say one? Gotcha. I'm sorry. You said, yeah. Just want to make sure. Okay. And then four and five are um, what we're going to go over tonight. And so by next Tuesday when we try this game again, um, four and five will be due next uh, Tuesday. So for tonight, this is where we are right there. And we're going to go over four and five. So without any further ado, unless you guys anybody have any questions before we get started on Chapter 4. Okay, chapter four. So probabilities, and then, like I said, I'm going to zip, excuse me, zip through this because you guys all have um, this, and you don't need me to read it to me. Everybody remembers what a Venn diagram is from high school, right? There are those yeah. circles that there's those circles that nobody ever really made any sense of, but yet they still use them as if everybody understands. Them. Uh, so we're going to talk about probabilities. What's the probability of an event occurring? Um, and I'm just going to skip ahead to the demonstration exercises, um, which is this basic probability. So the probability of something happening is always going to be between zero and one. You can never have a negative probability of something happening. Either it's not going to happen at all, or it's 100% going to happen definitely, or it's somewhere in between there. When you add up all of the possible options that could occur, all of the probabilities for those options will always equal to 100%. Something is going to happen. We don't know what. The probability that it will be 1, or the probability that it will be event 2, or the probability that it will be blah, 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 all the way up to event n, is always going to add up to 1. So that's what we're talking about here. So let's go to uh, demonstration exercise 3. And I'm, obviously, I'm jumping ahead here. So here's our data set. 
and I'm going to go to our calculation. Here we're going to say we want to, well, see, way too far ahead. Let's continue on here for a second. Uh, so there are three different ways of looking at it. Classically, it's just, is it going to happen? Assuming that they're equally likely, it could be this or this or this. Relative frequency is, if, if, I, if I did it 100 times, 40 times it would be this, 30 times it would be this, which would leave 30 more for the third option. So it would be 40 out of 100, 30 out of 100. That's the relative frequency. And then essentially assigning probabilities based on ju judgment is called um, guessing. So don't do that. So again, this is the breakdown of the classical approach. Blah, blah. So here's an example. The idea is that the number of defects happening I'm, I'm going to actually measure it. I'm going to go out there and physically sample it and say, I found exactly six that had no defects. I found exactly five that had three defects. So I'm, I'm calculating it based on actual occurrences. So in, in that case, I'm, I'm going to calculate the probability based on something that I've determined somewhere else. I've taken this random sampling and measured the defects. Now I can calculate probability of for it happening again because I'm using the statistics for that. So the, this is that relative frequency that it, the second way of doing it is instead of saying the number of times that it happened, the total samples was 25. And for the number of defects, for the number of samples that had zero defects, there was six of them. Six divided by 25 gives me a 24% possibility of this, 36% possibility there would be one defect, etc. So that's what that relative frequency of a defect in this sample is, or the relative frequency of a probability, more generalized. Um, and then subjective is, like I said, a, a, a guess. And so we're not going to try to guesstimate. We're going to use the other options. So there's simple probabilities, which is what we just described, and then conditional probability. Conditional probabilities is uh, we'll get to it in a second. So, simple probability is perfectly example right here. What's the odds that you're going to, um, you know, draw an ace out of a out of a deck of cards? Well, there's four aces, one of each suit. So, drawing an ace would be four out of 52. Drawing an ace of spades would be one out of 52, unless you're cheating and you have one up your sleeve, and then you get shot. So, don't do that. Um, so again, I'm going to jump ahead to conditional probability. That's the first example that I want to go through. Uh, so the conditional probability is the probability that an, an event is going to occur given that another event has already occurred. So given that B happened, now what is the probability that A will also happen? Okay. So this is the the format. How how they denote that is the probability of A given B, okay? Um, so assuming that I already drew one ace, now instead of having 52 cards in my deck, now I only have 51 cards, one of the aces is no longer there. So now I've already drew you know, B, given B here, B was I already drew one ace. A, the probability of A, given that I already drew one ace, is now there's three aces left in the deck, and I have 51 cards left. So it was 4 out of 52, and then given that B happened, now I only have 3 out of 51. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if those two events were statistically independent, then the, the um, probability wouldn't have changed for that second ace. But in this case, they are statistically dependent because the odds of that the second ace coming out changed because of the odds uh, of because of the ace already being drawn. It changed the odds of the second event. So they're statistically dependent on each other. Okay, so I want to go to this example quickly. This is the um, sample uh, example 4.3, and it's the probability of something occurring, occurring given that something else occurred. Is that big enough? Do I need to zoom that in? How does that look on your screen? Uh, can you zoom it in just a little bit? How's that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So here is our data. 
so if you guys have your books there, it's on page 115. Here's our data. Um, so this is obviously the gender of a student, and this is the uh, uh, instrument that they play. And so on option A here, we're going to say, given that the student is a boy, so that's limiting it to this one and this one and this one. Given that it's a boy, what is the odds that the student plays a violin? Uh, I don't know where violin came from. <laughs> the odds that the student plays an accordion. Well, there's a boy guitar. There's a boy accordion. There's a boy guitar. So there's only one out of three. So if you can see that tiny little formula up there, or here, you know, when I turn into edit mode, I've got one boy that plays an accordion. So given that it's a boy, I only have three options, there's only one that plays an accordion. Now, interestingly, if I reverse this and instead say, given that it plays a, that the student plays an accordion, what is the odds that it's a boy? So I'm going to undo that highlighting. So here's an accordion, and here's an accordion. I'm going to highlight those. So there's two accordion players, and given that there's an accordion being played, what is the odds that it's a boy? Well, there's a girl, there's a boy, so now it's one out of five. The exact same events have different probabilities because one of them is dependent on the other one in a different order. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. so the important sorry. thing here is to is to recognize which um, which question is being asked. So to, to to make sure that you uh, address this math in the correct order, you have to recognize what question is being asked. Does that make sense? So can you, how does that sound like A? So that what A is asking is what is the probability of a student that plays an accordion given it's a boy? What is the, stu what is the probability that a student plays an accordion given that the student is a boy? Here it's what is the probability that the student is a boy given that the student plays an accordion? Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So given this piece of information here, what is the probability that this piece of information here is, is correct? Is, is the way that that's read. What's the probability that this happens given that this is the case or given that this has already happened? So in this case, I've got two accordion playing students. Given that it's an accordion playing student, what is the probability that that student is a boy? So one of my accordion playing students is a boy. So that gives me the one student out of two accordion playing students. Okay? Everybody clear on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let me turn in my pages here. Statistical independence, where I talked about. I'm not going to beat that up. Um, so given... Let me close this one. Close that. Okay, so joint probabilities. This gets back into, and, I, and we haven't defined them yet here. This upside down U means intersection of, and it's the joint probabilities of two events occurring together. That's what this intersection is. So going back to our Venn diagram, uh, way up here to our Venn diagram, we go. this is the intersection of these two different events. So there's this orange event and there's this blue event. The intersection of them is this 0.5 in the middle. The union of them is both of them together, the intersection of them is this 0.5 in the middle. And that intersection is what's shown in this uh, in this equation here. This upside down U is the intersection. Okay, so the probability that these two things are going to happen is the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Okay, if they're dependent events. If they're independent events, then the intersection is just the probability of A times the probability of B. So make sure you interrupt me if you have questions. If they're mutually exclusive, so if you look back at our Venn diagram, 
if those two circles didn't overlap in any way, shape, or form, then the probability of both things happening is zero. You know, the overlap of the circles is what's the likelihood that both are going to happen? Well, if there's no overlap, then there's no probability that both will happen. Okay? That's called a mutually exclusive. Either or is the union. So it's the probability that A will happen plus the probability that B will happen minus the probability of the intersection of them. So let me see. Okay, let's go back to our Venn diagram. Here's our Venn diagram. The probability of this happening is 0.8. The probability of this happening is 0.6. So then the probability of either or happening is the point is the 0.8 plus the 0.6 minus the probability of the both happening, which is the 0.5. Or done differently, it's the 0.3 plus the 0.5 plus the 0.1. Now hold on to that thought, keep that image in your mind, and we'll go back to the formula. I want to I want you to be able to picture this, there's two different ways of doing this when we go back to the formula. Uh, right here. So the two different ways were I said what's the probability of the whole left hand circle plus the probability of the whole right hand circle minus the overlap of the two circles. That's one way we can figure out that. Or it's just the probability of the left hand circle plus the probability of the right hand circle if they're mutually exclusive, if the circles aren't overlapping. Okay? So let me see. Have another example 4.5. So I've got a probability of 0.7 that model. Oh, I've got to zoom in, sorry. So this example is on page 119. I've got the probability of model A being successful of 70%. I've got the probability that model B is successful at 80%. Assuming that those two are independent, then the probability that both will happen is the probability of 70% of, uh, times 80%. So what's the probability that both will be successful it's, and that those are independent variables is just the multiplication of the two. So let's, let's go back to here um, and go back to here. See this multiplication rule for independent events. Probability of A or B is the probability of A times the probability of B. Go back to the Excel formula. The probability of A times the probability of B because we're assuming that they're independent, okay? But if we assume that they're not independent, then it becomes a question of the first one has to be successful before we can determine that the second one, what the odds of the second one happening. So in this case, for model A to be successful and then model B to be successful, uh, I don't know how he does. Where did you get that number? Is that given here? I'm on page 119. Oh, okay, so that's given in the problem. That's where that came from. Assuming that, based on the fact it's estimated that if, if model A is successful, then the probability that model B is successful increases to 90%. That, that's where that 90% came from. So. This is new information that's been added to the pro to the problem. So, if this hap if A is successful, then now the probability that, that B is successful increases to to ninety percent. If A if uh, A was not successful, then you're back to um, just eighty percent. So now, what's the probability of A and B being successful? The probability of A being successful is 70%, but the probability of B being successful, given that A is successful, is only 90%. So 90% of 0.7 is the likelihood that both are now successful. Again, the thing to stress here is the joint probabilities, assuming independence 
or assuming dependence, that those two are dependent on each other. Okay, so again, the, the stressing point is that these are joint probabilities. There's some relationship, what happens, what's the odds of both happening together? Okay, I'm not going to bother with the mutually exclusive events, we'll just keep on going. Mutually exclusive events have, have essentially no relationship on them. So conditional probability um, example four point eight are are you following me so far? Am I losing you? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Good. All right. So I'm on page one twenty four now. The conditional probability of uh, uh, two of the lead sales reps are making important sales calls this week. Rep A has a 60% likability. Oh, I forgot to zoom again. Sorry, guys. There. Can you read that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So rep A has a probability of making 60% sales. Rep B has a probability of making 80%, uh, probability of 80% of making sales. And the probability that both makes sales is only 50%. So probability that B makes a sale, uh, excuse me, the probability that A makes a sale given the probability that B makes a sale. Okay, how do we do that calculation? We, the, the formula is given on, on page 123. The conditional equals the joint probability over the simple probability. So again, this is a conditional probability where we're saying what is the probability that A makes a sale given the condition that B has already made a sale? So in that case, I've got the uh, joint probability B4, cell B4. So again, for the Excel users, I put in the equals 0.4, equals B4 into this formula. So it's pointing at this cell right there. That's my joint probability is 50% divided by I put in the B3 here, which takes me to this cell, divided by the 0.8. So 0.5 divided by 0.8 is the probability that B will make the sale, but that A will make the sale given that B has made a sale. So okay. you're you're using you're dividing it by by the B because the B is like the catalyst, pretty much. If something doesn't happen with B, nothing's going to happen with A. Exactly. So okay. Yeah, because in this case, for 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 this to be considered at all, you're already making the assumption that B has made the sale. So okay. that's where the, the dividing it by B3 comes from. We're going to go like that. When I'm dividing it by B3, it's because I'm making the assumption B3 already happened, or I wouldn't be entertaining this question at all. Okay. So given that B3 has occurred, now what's the occurrence of point uh, of of A making a sale? So now you can see here, this is a higher number. Six and a half is a higher number than 50% because I've already taken into account this 80% odds right here. This 80% odds has been taken into account. I've already made the assumption that that happened. So that 20% likelihood of it not happening, I can throw it away. I can ignore that. That 20% likelihood of it not happening was built into this 50%. Since I'm throwing away that 20%, the likelihood of both happening now is going to go up because I'm predetermined that this one already happened, that the B sale already happened. See, so that's why this number is higher than this number. Does that make sense? Mm hmm Okay. So now here I flip it and I do the, the exact same thing but in the opposite direction. The probability that, uh, that A has made a sale is 60%. When I divide the probability that B makes a sale, Okay, now I'm looking at the joint because both of them happen, but I'm throwing away the probability that the 40% probability that A didn't make the sale. I'm throwing that away because I'm already stipulating A made the sale. That's why I'm dividing it by the B2. Um, and again, this, this formula is on page 123. It shows you the probability of B making a sale, assuming that A made a sale, is the joint probability divided by the simple probability. So 83% likelihood. Does that make sense? Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, Venn diagrams. Okay, so this is the similar or maybe even the exact same one that we were looking at on the front page. So we've got two different events, event A and event B, that have occurred or that can occur is a better way of saying it. 80% chance, that's the 0 0.3 here and the 0 0.5 here, together that's 80% chance that someone will, event A will occur. There's a 60% chance that event B will occur. So that's that 0 0.1 right there and the 0 0.5 right there. Together those add up to 60% likelihood of B happening. But the overlap, this important third line, this is saying how much of those circles overlap. That's why they break this 80% here and this 60% here. That's why they break those numbers apart, because it's shared in the center. Oops. It's shared in the center here. There we go. Um, that 50% of that 80% is shared. 50% of that 60% there is shared. So there's a 30% plus a 50%. It's the 80%. There's a 10% plus the 50% gives me the 60%. Now, the interesting thing here is, where's this other 1% out here come from? Well, that's the likelihood that either event A nor event B will happen. So again, if I add up these numbers, 3 plus 5 is 8, plus 1 is 9, there's only 90% of it inside these two circles, event A and event B circles. That means 10% of it is not event A or event B. Okay, so that's the information that's being conveyed in there. See this, this again, the total always is going to add up to one. Total, from, from the very beginning here, when an event is scheduled to occur or, or is, is going to occur, something is going to occur, and it could be this, 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 or this, the sum of those is always going to add up to one. So my sample space is always going to add up to one. Here's the events that are going to happen. If either of these happen, I have to add in a number here that's going to make that all add up to one. Okay? So that's an example of a Venn diagram. And the, the rules that we just talked about can be shown on the Venn diagram. So in this case, if we want to see the union of events, what is the probability that both will happen? How likely is it? Well, the shopper we chose has bought either of these. So it, ha it doesn't have to be both. It would be either this one or this one. Somehow we sold a ticket, right? So if I go back up to here, it could be sold this way. It could be sold this way, right? Either way. So I'm subtracting the overlap from the sum of them. I've got my 0.8% that it was sold um, online. There's the 0.8. Or I've got my 0.6, 60% that it was, uh, oh, okay, these are different. My bad. So 80% that it, an airline ticket is bought, bought online, 60% that a book is bought online. But I can't just add those two together. I've got to subtract out the overlap between them. That's what this formula right here is doing, is subtracting out the overlap. So the 0.8 for the airplane ticket, 0.6 for the books, and 50% who bought the one also bought the other. Well, if I want to know that it's likely that they did something, not that they did both. So I'm going to subtract out the amount that did both, and that's where this 0.9 comes from. 90% bought either a airline ticket or a book. Or, like I said, there's two different ways of doing this. Frankly, I think this is the hard way. And this is the easy way. The easy way is I just say 0.3 plus the number that have bought an airline ticket plus the number that have bought both plus the number that have bought just a book. See, that adds up to the same 0.9, whichever way I do it. This is the number that have bought airline tickets. This is the number that have bought books. And this is the number that have bought both. I have to take those back out because I essentially counted them twice. So I'm coming, I'm using two different methods to come up with the same answer, which is how many have purchased online. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Adrian.
You're welcome. Uh, say that again? I said you're welcome. Oh. <laughs> okay, so let me see. I know I have an example on this one. You know what, I don't need to give that example because it's just what we just talked about. So we'll skip that example. Okay, next is um, conditional probability is, again, what we just talked about, the way that the conditional probability would be uh, presented would be the probability of a joint event happening divided by the probability of the simple probability of it. So this is exactly what we were just looking at, the probability that only uh, for the probability given that A occurred, so here's the probability given A occurred, what is the probability that now B will occur? Given the probability that you've purchased an airline ticket on the internet, what is the probability that you will now purchase a book on the, on the uh, internet? So this is the same formula that we looked at a little bit ago. The probability of buying the airline ticket was 80%. The probability of buying both, the overlap on those two circles, was 50%. So the probability of B given A is now 62. Okay, complementary event is, again, just the sum. The probability of A prime is unity, probability of something, which is always going to add up to one, minus the probability of event A. So there's event A, and this is the probability of not event A. Does that make sense? Seems pretty straightforward. Okay, mutually exclusive, that's the circles that don't overlap. Okay, so the next pool that we'll look at, and this is kind of useful for, uh, uh, instead of a Venn diagram, we have more options. Now you can do what's called a probability tree to look at it, and cross-tabulation tables is an, uh, another one. So we'll just skip right ahead to here. So given the likelihood that something is going to happen, then there's a 25% that it'll be, in this example, under budget. Can you guys see that? I like that. See that, that better? 25% probability that this uh, project will be under budget versus the opposite, not under budget, meaning, oops, uh, So, given the, the, uh, the probability of 25% that it's under budget, the probability that it's not under budget is going to be 1 minus the probability that it is under budget. So that's where this 0.75 comes from. So, starting from here, I've got a 25% chance of going this way, and I've got a 75% chance of going this way. Assuming now that I'm under, not under budget, that I'm over budget, at, at this point, I still have stage 2 of the of the project where I could again be under budget or over budget. Now you see this is a dependent variable. The odds of being under and over budget for part B has changed. How do I keep you that? Uh, the odds of B has changed based on whether or not I was under or over budget on A. Okay? So now is the interesting part when we get to here, what are the odds that I make it all the way to outcome one? Outcome one is I'm under budget on A and under budget on B. That would be outcome one. I have a 15% chance of that. Well, the, re the way I got to that is a quarter of 60% is 15%. So I multiplied the 0 0.25 times the 0 0.6. Probability of A occurring, 25% times the probability of B occurring given that A occurred got me to this 15 percent. Okay, Same exact process here. The probability of B not occurring times the probability that A did occur gets me to outcome two. Are we clear on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to pull up an example on this, which is on page 132, example 411. Close that. So here is a decision tree inside of Excel, and I'm starting here and I'm saying what's the odds that it's effective, defective, 2 out of 20 are defective, so that's a 
So this C1, C, oh, I got to zoom in again. That's going to screw it up because you guys won't be able to see the whole thing. Um, so let's start up here. Um, so it, given in the problem, a shipment of 20, I'm on page 132. A shipment of 20 replacement battery charging units was shipped, and it contained two defective units. So this is where this number right here in C1 came from. Two out of the 20 were defective, which means 10% were defective. So here on my on my tree, my probability tree, I have put in 10% here odds that it's defective. So that is just looking up here at the formula. I like that equals C1. I'm just looking up at this cell saying, what did I determine the odds were that it was defective? Now I go down here to the other branch of my probability tree. Here it's just 1 minus the odds that it is defective. Odds that it's not defective is now 90%. Now, just like we did in the example in the book on the PowerPoint, uh, given the fact that this one is defective, now what are the odds that the second unit is defective? One out of 19. I already took one defective one out. So there's only 19 options left. What are the odds that I'm going to grab the second defective unit? One. There's only one defective unit left in there out of the 19 units left. So one out of 19 gives me that 0 0.053. That's the odds that the second unit that I grab is the defective one. The odds that the second uh, unit I grab are not defective is down here on this branch, which again is just one minus the odds that it is defective, or 18 good ones in there out of the 19. Okay, see how I got that? And again, the odds that I grab the number defective, which is the number two, is going to be, I'm going to multiply the odds of the first one being defective times the odds of the second one. Same exact thing here in this cell, the odds of the first one being defective times the odds of the second one not being defective. And that's the way the uh, probability tree works. You're just, essentially, you're drawing yourself a roadmap to show when this happens, then what are going, what's going to be my dependent odds of the next event. Does that make sense? What's the last column? This last one, the number of defective, these are the possible outcomes. So when I grab a sample, what are the odds that I'm going to have zero defective? What are the grads, odds that I'm going to have one defective on that sample? What's the, fa the odds that I'm going to have one? And then what is the odds that I'm going to have two? That's the number of defective. Each one of those is a different outcome. Okay. Okay. Okay, so onward and upward. So Bayes is another way of doing exactly what we just did with the uh, probability tree. The probability tree gives you a visual method of doing it. The, Bay the Bayesian method um, provides you with a simple sim I wouldn't say simple, with simply a mathematical way of doing it instead of doing it graphically the way we just drew it out. But the exact same thing is happening. I'm uh, multiplying all these sequences of events together. So here's the ugly, ugly equation. So again, <laughs> again, we're looking at it and saying, what are the odds that this is going to happen and that this is going to happen as I walk my way down the tree? So I'm going to bring up four dot. Uh, let's see, which one did we just look at? Let's look at four dot twelve which is one way of doing the same problem. So that's on page 135. And then I'm also going to bring up 4.13. Okay. So here is a very simple looking thing. Here's a very complicated looking thing. But we're looking at the exact same data. So here is city bus A is late. Let me zoom in for you guys. Here is city bus A is late. Odds are 6%. Given city bus A being late, then city bus B is also late, would be 40%. However, given that city bus A is on time, then therefore the odds that city bus B is also on time is 
Okay, that data oops, is the exact same data that I have here. Okay, I'm looking at it slightly different, but there's the 60%, or excuse me, there's the 6%, uh, and there's the 40% that I have right here. Okay, now what I've done here differently is I've said, here's the odds that it was going to be late. Therefore, one minus that, what's the odds that it's going to be on time? 94%. If it's late 6% of the time, it's on time 94%. So here I've got the same exact number that I have here, the 40%. Here I have what's the odds that city bus A is on time and, there, and then bus B is on time is 98%. Here I have the city bus A is on time, but then B is late is 1 minus 98% or 2%. So you can see I'm, I'm modeling the exact same events in both cases. Now here, what I what is it that we're looking for? The percentage of time that bus B is late. So if we say that bus A is on time and then bus B is late, then I'm going to say 94% times 0.02% gives me this. Here, if bus A is late, and bus B is also late, then I've got 6% times 40% is 0.024%, or 2.4%, excuse me. So then to add that up, what's the probability that B is late? Then I'm going to add this probability of B being late. So bus A was on time, but then bus B was late. Here's my first number. Bus A was late, and then bus B was also late. Here's my second number. So let me highlight that. And highlight that, those are my two probabilities that B is going to run late, 0 0.024, 0 0.018, which is the formula that I entered in right here. I'm looking at these two cells, 0 0.024, 0 0.018, or F12 and F27. That's going to be the probability of B being late. So you can see how I did this. I just kind of traced these two paths and said of the end of the path, of the things that happen at the end of the path, what are what is the sum of B being late? Now, let's do the exact same thing using Bayes' formula. Well, actually, sorry. This is the second. He compares the second one, so we'll compare the second one. Here we're going to say, what is the probability that bus A is late given that bus B is late? Okay? So following our tree, uh, so this is on page 136, top of page 136. Uh, remember, this is our joint sample. So here is the probability that B is late, and we want to know what the probability of bus A being late, given that bus B is late. Okay. So the joint probability, let's click on the right one, is the F12. So there's F. 12, there's the probability of both being late. Remember, the joint probability was both things happening. This happening, given that this happened, gave me this joint probability. Remember, we've gone over that two separate occasions. The joint probability divided by the simple probability. So there's the joint probability, 0 0.024, and then the simple prob probability of bus B being late. Did you follow that? Mm -hmm. So the probability of bus B being late is this simple probability that I worked out by summing up these two events. That's the probability of B being late. Probability of bus A being late given that bus B is late, I've got the joint probability on the top and the simple prob probability on the bottom. There's my simple prob probability. I like that again. Okay. So there's my simple probability. Okay, so when I click on F2 there, there's my joint probability. The probability that both happen, 0 0.024, is cell F12, cell F12. Divided by the simple probability, is what I calculated there, gives me that if bus B is late, then 56% of the time bus A is also late. Okay, so that's a long, complicated way 
of looking at something, trying to figure out one simple little question. And we'll go back over here, and I've got the exact same information. We're modeling the exact same thing, but I solved this in a much simpler method. Now, obviously, I had to use this big, ugly formula, but the formula is given. Now, there's the formula. What's the probability of A1 happening times the probability of B given A1? divided by blah, blah, blah. So let's look at it here. Here is the probability D2 is the probability that bus A is late times the probability of D4, which is B being late while city bus A is also late. So when we go back to this formula, what we've just said, what we've just is these two events happening. I'm not going to belabor this too much longer. The point is, you've got you've got a formula that can model two events, or can model more than two events. This is the general form. We're just going to look at two events. So, given those things, so you can go back to this example 413 and compare it 412. You can go back to those two and compare it to this formula here, and you can see what values they put in for the probability of a1 occurring, or for the probability of b occurring, given that A1 occurs. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so let's look at this again. The probability of A1 occurring is this D2, which is the probability that bus is late. Bus A is late. Let me go back to our our uh, uh, brain farting, our probability tree. <laughs> Excuse me. Let me go back to our probability tree and look for uh, probability of A1. Okay. D2 is the 6%, the probability that city bus A is late. That's the probability of A1. Go back to here. Probability of A1. This is the first occurrence option for A. Probability that's late is 6%. That's the first number that we're referring to right here. This A1. I can't highlight. This A1 right here, the probability of A1, the first event for A, is that 6%. That's where it comes from in uh, this formula. D2 is pointing up here at 6%. The next portion of our Bayesian equation is times the probability of B given that A1 did occur. So I'm going to go back to our, our tree. So given that A1 occurred, now what is the probability? Given that A1 occurred, now what is the probability that B also occurs? So that's this 0 0.024. So let me go back to here. The probability that city bus B is late given that city bus A is late. So here is the probability. This is given in the in the pro, uh, in the problem. The probability of city bus A being late, uh, of B being late, given that city bus A is late, is given as 40%. So those are the numbers that you're putting into this formula. So the important the important skill to have here is to be able to read this formula and look at what's given to you in the problem. Uh, where are we? 413. There it is. Okay. So probability of A1 occurring is given right here, 6%. The probability of B occurring, given that A1 occurred, is right here. Probability of B occurring, given that A1 occurred, there's the 40%. That's what's in the numerator of our equation, is 6% times 40%. Now we got the denominator of our equation, which is the probability of A times the probability, so it's the exact same thing, is repeated down here, plus the probability of, in our case, A not happen. So it's not late, it's on time. This is where this point ninety four came from. It's, it's to plug it in for the probability of A2 happening. And then the probability of B, given A2 happening, is where we came up with this 0.02. Does that help? Does that make sense? So again, they, they, what you're trying to what you're trying to do here is read what each of these 
factors in this equation are referring to. And then back here in your in your problem, you're trying to ensure that you're using the correct ones. So again, I'll run through it again. Probability of A1 occurring. And we'll go to our uh, probability tree. So the problem here's here's A. The probability of A1 occurring is the six percent. The probability of B occurring, given that A occurred, is forty percent. Probability of A not occurring is 94%. The probability of B occurring, given that A did not occur, so there's A occurring up here. Here's A not occurring. So the probability of B occurring, given that A did not occur, is 20%. Those are the numbers that get plugged in here. So I'm trying to show you how this ugly equation that we've got in here, okay, these ugly things happening in here, is directly related to the um, numbers on this tree. Here's the probability that A did occur. That's the probability of A1 from this equation. There's the probability A1. There's the probability A1. Everybody follow that now? Yes. Yeah. The next factor here, probability that B occurs given that A1 did occur. Here's the probability that B occurs given that A1 did occur. So that 40% is what goes in there. So it was 0 0.06 times 40% there, 0 0.06 times 40% there, plus what's the probability that A did not occur? The probability that A did not occur is 0 0.94 times the probability that B occurs given that A2 did not occur. Go back to here. Here's the probability that A did not occur. Here's the probability that B does occur. Follow that? Mm -hmm. The probability that B occurs given that A did not occur. Here's the probability that B occurs given that A did not occur. Okay? So again, the, the point is I, I'm, I'm not sure you guys are buying buying my premise yet. The premise is this is an easier way of solving this problem than this is. Drawing this out and, and, and trying to track all of these all these numbers down is more difficult than just plugging it into Bayes' formula. Okay, so again, I'm not going to beat that point any further than that. But when you look at example. Uh, when you look at example 413, you're just doing exactly the same thing as the um, uh, probability tree does. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. So, this is probably a lot more familiar with you guys. Essentially, what you've done is taken a poll or taken a count or done something. So in this, in, in this case, we've counted the number of students and said that 160 are of the student body are, are freshmen. 125 of the student body are soft, sophomores. Okay, And then you break, break it down, male, female. This, this is pretty standard. You guys are used to seeing tables of numbers. The interesting thing that we're going to do here is we're going to turn these into probabilities. Okay, so. 460 of my total students are male, well, that's 46%. 16% of my total total population of students, 16% of them are male freshmen. 34% of all of my students are freshmen. So you see how I essentially I just turned in counts of numbers into probabilities. Questions on that? Okay. Uh, not going to beat that up. I think I have another example. No, I don't. Okay. Not going to beat that up. Okay. Combinations and permutations. Does anybody remember these from high school? No. Did anybody anybody remember being confused by combinations and permutations? Yes. <laughs> so, 
a mnemonic that can help a little bit is uh, th that the difference between a combination and a permutation is that in one of them, the order counts. In the other one, the order doesn't count. Okay, so C and C, combinations and counts. Permutations, it doesn't count. So the order, uh, let's go back to combinations first. Combinations, the order counts. So I can say, well, I think I think that there's a good example. It's not here. Okay, uh, let's go to the example in the book. Four six. So page one forty four has example four sixteen. So what it's asking is what it's asking is. Um, you're going to choose six of ten job applicants to form a new department. Okay, it doesn't matter which order you choose them in. The point is that all six of them are going to be in the same department. So whether it's um, one, two, three, four, five, six, or whether it's five, six, four, one, two, three, that order is completely irrelevant. Okay, does that make sense? It's still the same department, no matter which order I've arranged those numbers in. It's still just one department. So when I'm looking at it that way, I'm putting it into groups. I'm saying, how many groups am I going to have? And within the group, I don't care what order they are. I just want to know how many groups there are. Okay? That makes sense? So the, the math itself looks funky. Um, in, in the book on page 143, you've got this cool little factorials. So everybody remember the exclamation point means factorial. And what in factorial means is, well, the example in the book is five factorial. So five factorial means I'm going to take five and then multiply it by every number lower than five. Five times four times three times two times one is five factorial. In factorial is I'm going to take in and multiply it by every number below it. In times n minus 1 times n minus 2, blah, blah, blah. If n is 20, then it would be 20 times 19 times 18 times 17. Okay, that's what the factorial means. If I'm doing a combination where I'm just essentially looking for the number of groups, then it's n factorial over n minus x factorial times x factorial. I don't care about those formulas. What I care about is that you can plug this into Excel. So here you can see when I say how many combinations are there, see how I do this in Excel. So instead of the, excuse me, instead of the exclamation point, in Excel you have this uh, formula fact. So if I click here, and remember if I click on this f of x insert function sign up there, I was hoping to bring it up on factorial. So factorial is returns the factorial number equal to one times two times three times blah 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 up to the number. So this is doing exactly the same as in the textbook where the exclamation point. Is. So for groups, if I want to know how many are in a group, then I'm going to say uh, factorial of the number to choose, which in this case is B2, divided by the number minus the number available. So the number available is 10. The number that I'm going to choose is 6. So that's where this uh, B1 is the number available, the number of applicants that are available. That's my N minus the number that I'm going to choose is the B2, 6, times, B factor, uh, times uh, X factor the number that I'm going to choose vectorial. So that's the way it looks like. I'm not going to be labor it. That's the way it looked like when you enter it into Excel. When you go back and look at this example problem, look at the formula on page 143, and you can see how these Excel functions correlate with the formula on, uh, on that page. Any questions on that? Can you guys see 
how Excel's formula matches with the combination formula in the textbook. Okay, no questions on that one. Okay, so that's a combination. The next one is a permutation, and in that case, what we're looking for is how can I, you know, order the order those six department members around a conference room table, for example. So would it be first number one and then number two and then number three, or would it be with number one and then number three and then number five and then number two and then number four? You see what I mean? Each one of those is a separate order, a separate grouping. Um, so I would use the permutations formula in that case. So let me close out. So on the calculator, is that um, the combinations of that, is that NCR and then the one that we're just discussing right now, is that the NPR? Or order does matter uh, NPR? On which calculator are you talking about? On a, just on a general specific, on a scientific calculator. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that it would, de it would depend on the manufacturer. The normal, uh, the normal way of showing that uh, a combination like that. Actually, I think I've got that in this. No, I you saw remember? that somewhere. The you normal way of showing it is n over x uh, with parentheses, long parentheses around it. I know I saw that somewhere. Where did I see that? I don't see it in the, in the textbook. The normal way of showing it is just n over x inside of parentheses, and that's a combination. I don't remember off the top of my head how a permutation is shown shorthand version. Uh, and, I, and I don't see it in the textbook. I don't remember where I saw it. Did I see it on here? Uh, I don't know where I saw it. So on a, on a uh, scientific calculator, if you see in over C, all inside of a single, like, tall parenthesis, that would be the combination. And you can, and you can play with your, your calculator, compare it to the results on these sample spreadsheets. So that right, right now what I have open is the permutation spreadsheet. So on your calculator, you could put in, you know, 8, enter 3, and then press your, press your button and see, does it come out to be 336? If it is, the that button you just pushed on your calculator is your permutation. I haven't used a scientific calculator in years because I just always use Excel. So again, this one, I'm not going to be late with the point, is exactly the same as what we did with the combinations, except we use the permutations formula on page 145 instead of the combinations formula. This one takes into, okay, so in the example, the example problem, they're saying, what order have you seeded them? So the order that you're seeding them is consequential, does matter. Order does count for a permutation. It doesn't count for a knowledge. Any questions on that? Okay, we're done with chapter four. Close that. Woo! I know, that was like speed reading. Oh. Evelyn Wood's speed reading program. Um, so let me switch to chapter five. Chapter <laughs> five will go a little bit faster. Like I said, I'm trying to get you guys through this quickly and still um, answer all that you need to get from this. Everybody still hanging with me? Do I still have everybody here? Mm -hmm. Good job, you guys. Yep. Oh, and Emily. Sure. Hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven of you, that's pretty good. Okay, so we're going to go over probability. Uh, I don't know. Discrete probability distributions in Chapter 5. I'm clicking through all of the homework assignments from Chapter 4. Now we're at Chapter so a lot of what we're going to talk about here is pretty similar to what we talked about uh, last week with, pro with uh, how we calculate distributions, but in this case, it's based on probabilities. But it's going to be somewhat similar. Uh, we're going to start here again, what, what I talked about at the beginning, 
any given probability of something occurring, any pro any event X occurring, the probability of that event is either going to be zero or it's going to be greater than zero up to one, maximum of one. The sum of any of the possible events occurring is always going to add up to one. So that's what those two formulas are conveying to you. Uh, so in this case, remember, this is what we did at the beginning. We had our 25 units, and we counted the number of, of events that happened, and then we calculated what the probability was what the probability of those was. 24% of the time, you would have zero defects. This is exactly what we did in chapter four. Here we just did a funky graph of it. Uh, does anybody want to remember how? I'll show you again how to do graph. Uh, but we've got an example of the problem shown coming up. I will show you. When we get to Real there. quick, um, yeah. kind of off topic, kind of on topic. Um, chapter for chapter two, I believe it was, for the, um, for the bends and like the greater than equal to whatever. Can yeah. you show that just real quick, man? Because that I just could not figure that out to save my life, and I just show you what? the on uh for chapter two, I believe it is chapter chapter two, question forty two. It asks to um, show some graph or some frequency distribution based off the greater than twelve less than 14 or something like that. Can you show how just to do that really quick? Let me, I'll actually pull up uh, yeah. chapter yeah. two. Yeah. Say that again? What was that, say that again? Was that Rachel? Was that you? Yeah, that was Sorry. Rachel. Sorry, it was my dog. I was putting him out. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so which problem did you say, 20? Oops. 42. Uh, Chapter 242. Well, maybe it is. No, this is not what I want. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. No problem. You sure? Chapter 242? Um. Chapter 342, wasn't it? Uh, let me check. No, yeah, it was chapter 242. Was it four? Okay, because I remember clicking my beep and I had to well, take I'm still in the wrong folder. Where did I hide those? Well, yeah, this one. Uh, chapter 242. Chapter two. Four, four. No, it wasn't on a quiz. It was homework. I just opened up the wrong. There we are. There it is. <laughs> well, see, that's the word. Though. That's where it was in the first place. I thought I had it. An Excel file. That's why I was fighting for it. I thought I had it in an Excel file. Man, I swear, an Excel file somewhere with those answers. In it. Oh well, we'll do it this way. So, what was the? What is your question about that problem? Um, just on the on the problem itself, I was asking to do some like just the whole problem itself. I mean, I com completely forgot how to do uh, like greater than, less than type of thing, and that whole, like, the Ben thing and all that. When you have to do the histogram, it won't let you make it by doing the 12 to 14 and the 14 to 16, and I couldn't figure out how to do it either. This yeah, is that's what you're right. talking about right here? This, this is what you're talking about right here? Just that whole problem within itself. No, you want us to separate them between 12 to 14 hours, 14 to 16 hours, 16 to 18 hours, and 18 to 20 hours. Okay. And you have to make a histogram with it, but it doesn't allow you to do that. It doesn't allow you to. Well, mine works. Not with those details. You can do it with 12, 14, 16, 18, but you can't do 12 to 14. 
Oh, that's weird. It's mine worked. I don't know what I, I did. Ended up having this too. I ended up having just make one from scratch, basically. So, I'm um, <laughs> looking at chapter 242 in the exercises. Below is a table of assembly time for 35 wind turbine blades. That's the one you're talking about, right? Hold on. It was problem number 42, yeah. I'm still struggling because I, I know I have somewhere an Excel spreadsheet. I just can't find it. That would be a lot more convenient. So this is the one you talked about. Yeah. So we're we're going to group all of that data. And you did you have a data file or did you have to type in all those numbers? I typed mine in. Yeah, I had to type mine in as well. Me too. List of from scratch file. You. I'll work with you. Hang on. Okay, so 12.5, 13.2. It would take a while, so 12 12.7, 13.6, 13.9, 13.5, 14.7, 14.1. It sounds like only one person felt like they were successful in this problem. Um, yeah, but I could have done it wrong. <laughs> 14 point 9, 15 point 6, 15 point 9, 15 point 3. Correct me if I'm making any typing mistakes. 4, 16 point 2, 16 point 7, 17 point 1, uh, what 17 point 6. 16.4, that's still on the right page, Looking and yeah, for my bin 12, it, the frequency is zero. Okay, show the times in a grouped data frequency table using the intervals 12 hours to under 14 hours. 12. Well, that's right, because it's zero to under 12. 14, and there's nothing under 12. 14 to so. 16. 16 to 18. And so on. What do you mean, and so on? How much farther am I going to go? To under <laughs> and so on. Um, well, suppose, hey, so there's an easy way to do this instead of typing in those numbers. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to type in the 1214, hold down the shift key, down arrow. Now I've highlighted the both. So we'll see those two in there, and it'll see how see how I'm dragging right now. Mm -hmm. Let me stop. Let me stop again. I've got, I've got a big white cross right now. And then when I move over here, it turns into a little black cross. As soon as I do that, I click with my left, and I start dragging. Excel sees the relationship between 12 and 14, and it just duplicates it. Okay? So I could go, what's the highest number I've got? 21, something. 22. 22 is 20. the highest number I've got. 21 point something is the highest number. I see. 21.7, right? Okay, so now it's asking me to, to do a histogram that you produced in part A. So is that your bin right there that you have highlighted? Say that again? Is that your bin? Those are those would be my bins. That's your bin, okay. Yes. So let me make sure. Uh, no, 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 no. So I should be able to just grab this data. So I just highlighted the whole row of data, and I'm going to go over here to data, analysis, histogram. OK. 
Okay. Input right now. Oh, I thought it would grab that because I already highlighted it. Oh, shift in, down arrow, highlight it. Enter. There's my histogram. My bin range is there. And my output range, I'll put my graph like this. Okay. Grab my input range again. A1, shift in, down arrow. That's your histogram again. Ah, how does that guy's doing? Does that see? Oh, 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 I see this. So, yeah, it's just calm. That's what I want with this. Uh, I think that's all I want, right? Click on OK. So there's none between 12 and 14. That's not right, is it? Well, because the 12, the bin 12 is yeah. 0 to under 12. It named, from what I understood when I did the thing was that from 0 to 12, or under just under 12, or under 12, was zero, and then from 12 to 14, or 14 bin was 12 to just under 14. Well, yeah, but there's still there's still numbers. There's a 12 and a half right there, so there should be one. Yeah. So you see what I just did is I threw in zero here to try to grab anything lower than 12. So how come that's not working? Is this, this is the same problem everybody else has? Yeah, yeah, so what I ended up doing was just yeah. In after I got that table, manually typing in the 12 to 14. <laughs> there's, there's a way to make it work. There's a way to make it work. We just have to figure it out. So let me let me try it. that again. It should be telling me. But the initial problem itself is asking you to put it kind of what Rachel was saying, that 12 to under 12, 14. Or excuse me, 12 to under 14, 14 to under 16. Is that what the initial problem was asking? Yeah. So this right here would mean anything from 12 up to and not including 14. How many of them are in this bin? 12 to up to including not 14. This bin would be 14 up to including not 16. This one would be 16 up to including not 18. Should be. Well, it's not giving those numbers. So what I did is I added on the number below there to see if it would give me the below. And it didn't so well. So there's my data. There's my bins. I'm going to change this to C2 and this to C8. I'm going to range it okay, It's not going to work because I didn't change it. Oh, it didn't. So why is that good? And this is what you're saying, that it provided the wrong number there. You, you were able to do everything that I'm showing here. It just didn't give the right number. Yeah. Okay. So mechanically doing the Excel portion wasn't the issue. Okay. So let's see if we have... Uh, an example... I don't think we do. I could have sworn that we had a uh, example from chapter two. Let's go back to chapter two's data. Chapter two. So there's one with Benny. So how come this one work? What did we do different? Twenty up to including thirty. There are two of them in this example. So you can see how in this example we've got the, the data and we've got the bins. So what did we do differently? In Wait, that that one. Sorry, that last one that you were just showing, that said 20 and including 
up to so there's seven total, twenty and including thirty. No, there's two between twenty and up to, but not including thirty. Not so including if you look 30. at your data okay. over here, there's a twenty and there's a twenty. Okay. I think you said here, including thirty. So. No, in here you've got five from thirty up to and not including forty. Okay. So there's a thirty. Okay. There's a second, third, fourth, fifth. So okay. in our case, we've got this exact same setup. Yeah, but in that one, all the numbers are in the bin. It's like 30, 40, 50 are all the, the numbers that the bins are. There's no You're numbers right. in the system. You're right. So what we're doing is we're defining our bins incorrectly. So let us do something different. doesn't ask us. Let's see what the help tells us. That's not going to help us at all. So here's an example closer to what we have. So 27 should appear inside of that range. See, I told you guys last week that um, don't be afraid to use the help. I use it all the time because there's so much to know about Excel that you can't just memorize it all. Use Excel. I mean, use the help. But everything that I'm looking at is exactly what we did. 20, 40, 68. So this would show up as less than 20. But then between 20 and 40, we would have 1, 2. So let's go down to the data. They don't give the results. Thanks, that was helpful. Okay, what are we missing over here? Because we're doing the exact same thing. Bin numbers must be entered in ascending order. Did that. If you don't enter the bin numbers on the worksheet, the Instagram tool automatically creates even more distributed. Let's let's see what happens if we don't close this. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we just leave the bin range empty. What happens? See, I find this stuff fun. I don't know if you guys find it annoying or not. It worked there. Well, would you look why, at that? Why did it like it that way? If it doesn't like it, if I give it things. So what it's saying here is from 12.1 up to including 14.02, there was only one. Well, that's not correct. Oh, you know what this is telling us? There's one below 12.1. Is that right? Yeah. Where's the lowest one? Oh, there it is. So including 12.1, there is one from negative infinity up to 12.1. Just one. From this up to, so it's from negative infinity up to and including 12.1. There is one. So that's what we're doing wrong. This is saying from negative infin infinity up to 12, there are zero. From, from just above 12 up through 14, there are seven. See how, see how doing it this way helped us to figure it out? The lowest one is 12.1. There's the 12.1 right there. So from negative infinity up to 12.1, there is one unit. Therefore, from just above 12.1 to including 14.02, there are six units. So we were using this opposite direction. I wonder if we can select. But the homework says to do not I know. I know. It's the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Because that's what I was trying to do by putting in the 10. Let's do this again. I stumped the teacher. 
Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, this is fun. That analysis, okay. So there's my data, my bin range. If I select that, and this is why I had put in zero initially. Output range here. Okay. Are you do isn't that what you just did? Well, yeah, except see how I've got the tan in there? But now that we know how this works, this is it's saying... Still wrong. I know, but now, now we can interpret this from zero, from negative infinity up to 10, including 10, there are zero. From just above 10 to 12, including 12, there are zero. From just above 12 to 14, there are seven. So how do I get it? Give it to me differently. Intervals 12 to under 14. I don't get it to tell me. So you guys just didn't want to go on to chapter 5. That's why it's still in chapter 2. So I don't want to say any names, but Chris told me to do it. This would be 13 Chris. Wow. <laughs> So what happens if we do it this way? 11, 14. Think that will work? So let's do this. And then equals that plus 2. Copy that. Paste it there. Then. No, I'm going to leave that. Data analysis. This to go. There. So not including fourteen. Yes, this is this will work. But it's not including the twelve or the third. Oh wait. Well, no, this is this is working from twelve up to not including fourteen. There's seven. There are seven. So, so this, this was hearing? working all along. This was working all along. That's what I was trying to say. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this was working all along. We Okay, so this is the solution. It was working all along. We were just misinterpreting. I am going to draw a arrow. See that? There's seven of them from 12 up to not including 14. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's nine of them from 14 yeah. up to not including 16. So why are the numbers why are the numbers not next to where they? Well, because remember, remember the the question is which one of these is defining what we're looking at. Well, this is defining. We want it to be less than 14. Show me anything that's less than 14 down to the previous bin. So there's seven of them that are less than 14 down to the previous bin. Here, it's saying, show, show me how many of them are less than infinity down to the previous bin. So none of them are over 22. Is that correct? Yes. Equals right. max. But that is correct? Be, yeah. But it won't ever include 12 because there's something below 12.1. Correct. So, so if I put in, actually, let's let's do this. Let's put in 111.1 just for the heck of it. So I just changed that 12.1 down to 11.1. And now I'm going to delete this. Uh, Wait, I did it right. And now, <laughs> and now go um, data, data analysis, history, output. Oh wait, no, that doesn't because I've still got the wrong things. Well, wait, this turns. Yeah, analysis. Okay, so you see what happened there? I changed that twelve point one down to eleven point one, and I've got one number that's less than 12. 
So that's what this line means is how many numbers are less than 14 but more than 12? See, see the way that arrow is pointing backwards? This is saying how many numbers are less than 14 but more than 12? There was 7. I changed 12.1 down to 11.1. This changed to 6. And now I have one number that's less than 12 and greater than negative infinity. So all, you guys all did it right, sounds like. You're just misinterpreting, and it took us a while to figure it out, the way that, the way that Excel is, is describing these bins. But if I put that arrow showing what it's referring to, does that make sense to you? There's 7 less than 14 greater than or equal to 12. There's 9 less than 16 greater than or equal to 14. Again, see how that, that arrow is leading you to it's greater than 12 and less than 14. So why in the yeah. bin right below that, do you, in the 12, do you have 1? In this one right here, I changed this from 12.1 to 11.1. The original data right here was 12.1. I changed that 11 point, that 12.1 to 11.1 to see if we could put one into that bin. See how the, that bin was empty? I changed one number, and then I put one into that bin by changing that one number. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just in the histogram, or the bin that I did, I had six in that category. If everything else is exactly the same, except for I only have six in the bin of 14. Well, um, I might have a typo in here, in these 35 numbers, or you might. Or yeah, maybe I... I <laughs> Yeah, it is 35 because I did it another. I did it two different ways because I I really wanted to figure out how to do the histogram, but doing the data analysis packet, but I couldn't get it to come out correctly. So I used the count this function, use like the greater than and less than function. So I came out with 35, right. and I got seven in that care in the 12 to 14 category that way. But that was the only way I could get it right. Yeah, and, and we can certainly do that as well. If, does anybody want to see that? How to do the it the count, other way? The count if thing? Yeah. Yeah, uh, he, Stephen, I think, was trying to explain it to me, but I didn't understand what he was yeah, saying. Let's do it right here. So here's my bins, and I'm going to say count if. Oops, count if. That this is my range is. Now here I'm going to say uh, open print less than close print and that. Or I said print on that quote. Close print. Okay, so there's my formula. Let me zoom in. Plus, 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 and then F2. So here's what's happening, and I've got to I've got to put in my dollar signs. I forgot to do that. Dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. Okay. So here's what's happening. I'm going to look at all of the numbers, all 35 numbers over here, and I'm going to say count them if they are less than. So that's this symbol, symbol, less than. And then I put in this ampersand because what I want Excel to do is combine this symbol with this cell address. Okay. So there is the number that are less than 12. Here is the number that are less than 14. Here's the number that are less than 16. So you see what's happening here is it's just adding them all up. But what I would do to find out how many are in that bin is that I would then subtract it from the previous total. Uh, that won't work either. Let's see what happens. Is that right? 7, 9, 14. No, that's. Well, um what I did is I used count ifs as in plural, yeah, so I that, could put multiple the, on it. That's a better solution. So everybody follow what he just said. I'll show you how, yeah. how he did how he did it. it. Count ifs means you have multiple things that you're doing. So you're gonna say, is it less than that, comma oh and actually this should be less than that or equal to. Is it less than or equal um here let's start all over. That's it. So count ifs is multiple criteria. So I'm still going to look at the same range of cells, and I'm going to say multiple criteria. 
So I want it to be greater than or equal to 12 and uh, less than 14. Too many parts. No, I didn't. Damn it. So, so just so you know, this is always the way I use Excel. I was like, okay, we'll try this. Oh, okay, we'll try this. Uh, because I can't ever remember it all. How come it doesn't like I, I posted my, uh, what I think would be the right formula in the chat. If you want to try that. I tried to make it relative to where you had your data. But. Uh, where is the chat? That's not the chat. Okay. Just have it. Don't, don't bother reading it. <laughs> 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 oh, you have to put, yeah, you have to put in the, the range twice. Yeah, see how it, does, <laughs> it even highlighted it for me. See, it highlighted my error for me. And I didn't even see it. I have to put in the range for each criteria. <laughs> Copy that. Paste there. Comma. Boom. Okay. Copy. Paste. So in this case, you can see essentially what we did is we lowered the right hand column by one cell. So now, before when Excel did it, and actually I'll just put it right here, data analysis. Okay. Okay. So here, the this column right here, we've just lowered by one cell. So if I just highlight that and grab it, drag it down, that's exactly what we have here. See how that works? Mm -hmm. Exactly the same results. So using count ifs, and then this is using the data analysis. And for all you guys that did the data analysis, you did it right. We just had to figure out the direction that it um, that it was pointing. You know, which where where do those sevens belong? And we we were interpreting that as being above here. Uh, excuse me, between 14 and 16 is seven. It's between 12 and 14 is seven. Makes perfect sense now that we figured it out, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Everybody clear on twenty four or forty two? Forty two. <laughs> At least until the next time I have to do that problem. Uh, sure. Well, the next time you have to do that problem, will will we'll be you know in class. It won't be in class. So 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 again, the point the point. <laughs> For, for you guys to see is, even I, as much Excel as I've done, I've still got to play around with it to, to see how did it work. So don't feel bad about having to figure it out. I do that all the time. Should I feel bad about not doing the problem? Because I did the, you know, the Yes, you should feel bad if you didn't make an attempt. Okay. <laughs> I now, killed let's me. get back to Chapter 5 where we are never going to finish this. Okay, who, who was it that originally asked their question on 24? 42. 42? Adrian. Gosh, Adrian. Dyslexia is going to kill me. Who originally <laughs> asked the question on 42? I did. Okay, does that help you? Yeah. That was very convincing, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you, you did it right. We just had to reinterpret which cell it was looking. They did it right. Oh, I thought you said that you. Okay. I can't keep, I can't keep track of, of, you know, who's asking the question. Sorry, guys. Okay, are we clear on number 42? Can we get back to chapter 5? Yeah. Hey, that okay. only took us 40 minutes. That's not bad. I know. Like I said, you guys just really didn't want to finish up chapter 5, I can tell. Okay. <laughs> so this was still chill, chill chapter. Two, I can close that. Are we back on chapter five? You can ignore it. Chapter five. Okay. So probabilities. This is where we're at. So the expected value. This is this is the summarization. This is those descriptive statistics that we've talked about. 
descriptive statistics about a probability. What's the expected probability or expected occurrence? It's going to be the mean. What's the variance? It's going to be the, you know, the exact same formula. It's the sum of the squares times the probability of those events occurring. Okay, does that make sense? So this is the exact same process we went before. I can calculate the mean by multiplying all of those equations, all those probabilities times the event that it happens, and then here's my expected outcome. So then the next step to be able to calculate my standard deviation is I'm subtracting the actual occurrence from my expected outcome. Remember, keep, keep in mind, this expected outcome, I'm just using this 152, is the expected most likely thing to occur. Zero times the probability of it occurring, one times the probability of it occurring, adding all of those up, give me the 152. One minus 1.52, two minus 1.52, that's the x minus mu squared times the probability of x. This is the exact same process that we went, before, went through before. Every time we do a variance, every time we do a standard deviation. Uh, excuse me, every time we do a mean, every time we do a standard deviation. Uh, can you tell I'm tired? Every time we do a mean and every time we do a variance, this is the same process that we use. Standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. Same exact process. Okay. Or you can use the the um, Excel formulas to do that for you. And we have an example on this. Which example is that? I think it's five three. How's your hotel, by the way? Say that again. How's your hotel? Um, it's you know a, it's a Bed and a, and a bathroom. That's all a hotel needs to be, and especially since all I'm doing is working in here. Um, this is not the right one. So five dot two. Okay. So this is here's the probability of something happening, or you know here's what what something is. It's either going to be a zero, or it's going to be a one, or it's going to be a two. This is pro, this is example five dot two on page 167. So either zero companies will be successful, or one companies will be successful, or two companies will be successful. What is the probability of that? 10%, 40%, 50%. X times the probability gives me, the sum of X times the probability gives me this expected value. Then I subtract that expected value from the mean and then square it. Okay and then multiply it by the probability. So here is, and I'm gonna go back to my, to my PowerPoint. This variance right here, x minus mu squared times the probability, sum all those up, here is my variance. So I just did this the long hard way, building out this table. Or I can use a function down here. The function down here is the sum product, Uh, F2, sum product of D5, so there is the sum of the means, times the probabilities. So the sum product is just taking this times those and adding them. Sum of the products. So multiply that times that, sum it. Multiply that times that. Excel does that for you here versus you doing it manually here. Same exact process we used before, except here we're using probability. That, so that, inform that information is all given, right? Like the probability of yes. that first part, that's all given, right? These two columns right here would be given. You would you would be calculating everything else on this page given these two pieces of information. Okay. So we're we're twelve we're twelve into it. I think we can do this still. Okay, so now, that was given a probability, but now we're going to talk about two distinct probability distribution um, um, options. So binomial distribution, remember when I was talking about how you could 
excuse me, how you could draw a, a bar chart and it would be skewed to the left or skewed to the right. Those are distributions and you would be binning the events in, now that we know how to bin things, we would be binning events into the uh, options. So given those distribution options, I can define the shape of that. The shape of that might be bi binomial. That'll be the first one that we talk about. Or the uh, second one would be, would be Poisson, uh, was, would be a different shape distribution. So in this case, uh, we're going to be looking at binomial. And the, the conditions for this essentially is two outcomes. So is anybody familiar with the, num with the binary numbering system? Binary being zero or one, okay? Binomial is based on that same root word, by two, by meaning two. Uh, so two conditions, it's either this or that. Only two possible things can happen. Uh, if that's the case, then you can use the binomial probability. If there's more than two options, then you can't use it. This, this, the other thing is that they have to be statistically in, independent. Each time something occurs, whether it occurred previously or not, isn't relevant. Okay? So that's what can determine it. Now, again, we've got this ugly function, and I don't want you to bother worrying about it. This one right here looks pretty much like, what do you guys remember? Was this the probability, uh, a combination, or was this a permutation? Permutation. Pretty sure about that? No. <laughs> this would be the combination yeah. uh, formula. Uh, and then all we're essentially doing is multiplying the probability of X happening times 1 minus the probability of N minus X. But again, don't get hung up on this because Excel will do the work for you. Just recognize that this is what's happening in the background. And the other thing is you've got to recognize that you've got three different pieces of information that you need. You need the number of successes that happened. You need the number of trials that it took to get that number of successes. And you need the probability of success on any one given trial. This probability is a constant, and it's completely independent of the number of trials. I could have a 10%, well, the, the obvious one is I got a 50% chance of throwing a head when I flip a coin. Regardless of how many times I've thrown it, I have the exact same odds every single time. Okay, so that's a, what a binomial um, function is, and this is the way it, it would be modeled um, in a probability tree, and we're not going to spend our time on that. I'm just going to go to the binomial example, page 172. Are you ever going to make, like, have us do one of those trees? I, yeah. I do think that one of the homework problems has one. I, I did look at the homework problems, but it, you know it was before yesterday. And my recollection is that one of them has it, but I might just be re recalling from the, the PowerPoint as well. So, sorry. Um, if, if, if it asks you to do one, you go to the example file and grab the example file, and you, you've got the tree already built. <laughs> that way you don't have to draw all the little lines. But I, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I, you know, I have no, a bad it's, memory. No, it's okay. I just think it would be easier to do the equation than the tree. It right is now. absolutely easier. Okay, so problem, problem, uh, exercise. 5.3 on page 172, 40% uh, of American of, of eligible American voters plan to vote. So any given person you talk to, the odds are 40% that they will say yes, they're going to vote, obviously leaving 60% odds that they're not going to vote. So you're going to pick, a, at random, four people. You're going to pick up the phone, randomly dial a number four times, and when they answer, you're going to say, are you going to vote? So you have five potential results. Either zero of them could say yes, or one, or two, or three, or four. That's how many um, yeses you are likely to get when you ask, are you going to vote? Zero, one, two, three, or four. So what are the probabilities of that? Now, instead, here's the cool thing. 
instead of that big ugly formula that we had in the cell, or excuse me, that we had in the PowerPoint. See this right here? Binomial dot distribution. Excel will do uh, this ugly formula for you. So instead of you having to type that in, remember when we did the combinations and the permutations, you had to type into Excel equals fact, open print, blah, blah, blah. There is a function for binomial built into Excel. You don't have to type in all the fact forms. So you just say binomial distribution, and then here it defines it for you. The first parameter is the number of successful trials. The second is the probability of success. Okay. So in this case, what we're saying is the number of successful trials is zero. The number of trials is four, and the probability is 40%. Go back to here. A7 is the probability of, or is the number of successful trials. B1 is the number of attempts. And B2 is the probability on any given attempt that it would be successful. So then I just copy that formula down. And again, let me do it one more time. See how I've got the dollar signs on here and the dollar signs on there? These two cells aren't going to change. It's always going to stay looking at 40, and it's always going to stay 4, and it's always going to stay looking at 40. But the first cell, A7, it's going to continue to change. So I'm just going to copy that down. The probability of getting at least one person to say yes, they're voting out of those four that I called is 34.5%. At least two, no, exactly two. Exactly two is 34.5%. Exactly three, 15%. Exactly four people saying yes is 2.5%. Uh, so here it's saying, you know, the question that it asks is, what's the probability that it is equal to 3? Okay, now here's where I want to show you guys something else in Excel. Okay, so here it's just saying probability equal to 3. So I'm going to look up here. Here's the probability equal to 3. I'm just, there's my value, 1536. There's my value, 1536. Here the probability of exactly one person. There's the probability of exactly one. So there's 34.56. So here I have the cell equals B. Now here, is the, what's the probability that it's greater than or equal to 3? Well, it could be that or that. So in my formula here, I'm going to say I want to sum these two. Now, one thing I want to show you here um, is if I go like this. And again, I'm just going to try to demonstrate formulas on occasion when they pop into my mind. So this isn't something you have to memorize. Or, but see what I have here is I've got this column that's in a nice order. And then I've got something next to this column that I'm interested in finding out. Okay, so what I want to know is where is the 3 in this column and what is the number next to 3 in the next column over? So Excel has a cool function called vertical lookup. So I'm going to say equals vertical lookup. And obviously it pops up the tool tip like it always does. The lookup value is 3. I want to find this value. And where am I going to find it? I want to find it in this table. So I'm going to press F4 to freeze that table. Now the next parameter is what column do I want to look in? I want to look in the second column. And then the last thing is range lookup. When I push the column there, it pops up the last tool tip. I don't want an approximate match for three. I want an exact match for three. Okay. So it's going to automatically look that up for me. Now, the cool thing about it is I can just copy that down and paste it there, and it'll look up the, the one for me. Or I could, what happens if I change it? I want it to be four. Put the four in there, and it automatically looks, updates that, that call. Looked it up right there, and it said, what's the number beside the four? What's the number beside the two? What's the number beside the zero? So that just popped into my mind while, while I was looking at this. I wanted to show you guys that, that function in Excel. 
not something you have to memorize. Just be aware that it's out there. It's a tool that you might need to use someday. Okay, does that make sense as far as the binomial distribution, how you're doing those calculations in Excel? Questions on this? Okay, I think that is a no. No questions on this. And I'm going to jump ahead because for some reason we spent a lot of time on, on CAP 2. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the Poisson distribution. It's the exact same process. The difference is when can you apply the Poisson distribution. So the Poisson is looking at something that's time or space or distance. It's a per, you know, so many miles per hour, so many units per, per square foot, some sort of per um, measure. Uh, and then the, it's always a constant. How many cars arrive per hour um, is a constant. It's not going to change. And if I multiply it by two hours, it doubles the number of occurrences. And they're statistically in, in, independent. Assuming all of those happen, then I can use this Poisson probability function. Again, don't get hung up on the formula because Excel does it for you. So let me close that one. Okay, let me look here. Which one? 5.7. So the exact same problem. I've got three things arriving per minute. What is it that's arriving? Checkout count. I've got three customers arriving at the checkout counter per minute. This is exercise 5-7 on page 1 So I'm going to do the Poisson distribution, and I'm going to say, what are the odds in any given minute of getting between 0 and 10? if the number of arrivals per minute on average is three. So over here in the function that I put in, it looks very similar to what I just did with the binomial distribution. This is a Poisson distribution. And I'm going to use, what am I looking up? So here, let's pop up. So here it's, uh, X is the number that I'm looking for mean is the average number of times that something happens, and the cumulative means I don't want to accumulate the percentages. Um, I could do that to see what that looks like. Copy that down, paste. So you see how I keep adding it. The odds that it's going to be 0, 1, or 2 is 42%. The odds that it's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's going to be 81%. That's what that accumulation is. In this case, what we're doing is for any given number, what's what's the odds that I'm going to get for in any given minute? 16.8%. Okay, so again, the idea behind this is I've got distributions that I can apply um, in certain situations. The binomial distribution, if I only have two possible outcomes and they're independent uh, variables, et cetera, then I can apply the binomial distribution and use that instead of having to calculate out all the percentages. Poisson probability, if I have something that occurs on a periodic basis and um, uh, you know they're independent variables and they are evenly distributed, um, then I can use the Poisson distribution. Throwing the formulas into Excel is relatively straightforward, assuming that you remember I'm looking for Poisson, and you can even find that up, find that just by looking up. I'll do this just to remind you guys. If I'm in a blank cell and I push this f of x, then it pops up the insert function dialog box, and I can click the down arrow and find statistics, and then I can scroll through there. Oh, there's a Poisson formula. I just give me what it was, and oh, there it is right there. Okay, so. Just like with the binomial, I can do the averages and the standard deviations with Poisson as well. And that's done. Look at that. Got it done with, eight, with one minute to spare. How's that? So questions on Poisson or binomial? Throwing those numbers into Excel is pretty straightforward, I believe. Any questions on how to do those in Excel? Anybody still with me? 
<laughs> no. Look at that. There's a whole bunch of people out here. It's really quiet. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay, so any questions? I, okay, you already answered no to no questions about how to put either of those formulas in Excel. Any question on how to how to determine whether you can apply one of those two distributions? Poisson applies for time-based or space-based number of cars per hour. That kind of thing. Binomial applies if there's only two options, either this or that. Both of them require them to be independent, et cetera. Any questions no, on no, that? but I, having two options, I don't understand Poisson, but I'll just have to read it again in the book. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me restate, let me go to the introduction of Poisson and go over that again. So, again, the example in the book is the number of cars arriving at a, at a, wash, at a car wash per hour. So just think of it as per something. Is it the number of ants per square foot in your office? You know, that's per number. Is it the number of, uh, of cars that arrive at the car wash per hour? There's some per measurement. And I'm going to take that per measurement, and I'm going to extrapolate it over time. How many occur in half an hour? How many occur in an hour? What's the odds of getting exactly five of them during this time frame. So there's there's the number that occur, and then there's the probability, or, or the proportionality, I guess. Is the the proportionality of it is, if I multiply that number times two, times three, times four, it's proportional all the time, and they're independent. If one car comes up, it doesn't mean that automatically a second car is going to come up, or if one car comes up, it's not going to stop the next guy from coming. Completely independent of whether I'm getting two cars this hour for my car wash or whether I'm getting zero. Completely independent. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, any any other attempts to stump me on any of the content from four and five? Are we good? Okay. So let's go back to here. And just remind one more time. So for next week, we'll have three questions from Chapter 4, and three questions from Chapter 5, and the quiz from Chapter – or quiz number three, which would be from questions from both. There's your questions file. There's your data file. Anybody, anybody still have any issues with being able to upload the homework or the quizzes, being able to click on those problems with that? No. no. You should definitely let us have the answers file. <laughs> you would like that if I if I unhid that one? Yeah. I'm sure you would. <laughs> okay. I think that this kind of worked. Any feedback on how the online session works before we do it again next week? Nope. No. No. Okay. I mean, once I got my microphone to work, I think it went really smoothly. You guys could hear me fine? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a little okay. choppy sometimes. Uh, was it? Okay, that was what I was going to ask with the video also. Was it choppy sometimes also? There was video? Of my, desktop. of my desktop. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. I didn't notice any of that on the video, but okay. no. I did. Yeah, me too. Okay, but overall it was understandable you could follow without any issues. Yes. Okay, yeah. then, we will, then we will do this experiment again next week. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good week. Thanks. Thank you. You Thank too. You. Good night. Have a good, good night. night. Bye. All right. Okay. What do I do here? Uh, I don't like fun too much.